In this message, we consider several aspects of God as our Heavenly Father. It is important to have a correct picture of God so that we relate to Him as He really is. This also fills us with confidence and strength as we face life's challenges because we know who our Heavenly Father is to us. The last several weeks, we've been talking about the Father's love. We've been talking about uh, the Father's love. And we are spreading this whole series over six Sundays. So um, we are building on it little by little. There is, uh, there's no hurry. We could actually compress it maybe if we want to do it in a hurry three Sundays. But we're actually stretching it out. Uh, and we're doing it little by little. And uh, I want us to just quickly review some of the things we've seen in the last two Sundays. And then take it forward. Uh, one of the opening statements we made is this. That your revelation of God affects your relationship with God. You know, what we think about God or our picture of God affects how we relate to God. So, for instance, if we think that God is always a God who is mad and angry, then we are very fearful people. There is no liberty in our relationship with God. We are always wondering, oh, when is that Fire and brimstone going to fall on me? Uh, if you make a small mistake, oh no, God is going to be so upset with me the whole day until he gets over his bad mood. You know, I mean, it affects how we relate to God because that's our picture of God. And not only that, and so therefore it's so important to have a good picture, a right picture of God as it is given to us in the Word. That's important, to paint your picture of God from the Word of God. And secondly, we understand that you know, how you relate to God will also determine how you relate to other people. If you experience God's love and God's forgiveness, then in that similar measure and similar manner, you will also be very uh, redeeming towards others. You will be loving, forgiving. Uh, you will begin to relate to other people based on what your experience with God is. So our picture of God is very important. And what we're doing in this series is, is focusing on one aspect of God. This is not the only aspect of God. There's one, this is one aspect, God as Father. Right? It's one of the many aspects of God we see revealed in the, in, the, in the Word of God. And we're focusing on this and saying, okay, if God is Father, uh, as a Father, who, who is He to me? How should I understand God as Father? How should I relate to Him as my Heavenly Father? That's what we're doing in this series. So we began in our very first message, part one, uh, Infinite Father, uh, just to lay some basic groundwork, that God is relational. God can be loved. God loves and God can be loved. So God loves, but He also can be loved. He can also be loved. That means He is touched by our love for Him. And he is also God who loves. And uh, we, in that first message, we said there are some wrong postures that we have before God. You know, we sometimes behave like the prodigals. Or we behave like the, you know, the proud elder son. And we have all different wrong postures. Uh, and that's not the way God wants us to relate to him. Part two, last Sunday, uh, we talked about the infiniteness, the immeasurable love of God. That means God's love for us is so great, there is no measure of the length, the breadth, the depth, the height. But the point is, Paul, as he writes in Ephesians 3, he wants us to be deeply rooted and securely grounded in God's immeasurable love for us. That means you and I should not be shaken from the fact, from the truth, that God loves you with an immeasurable love. There is no measure of the length, the breadth, the depth, the height of God's love for you. And you and I must be deeply rooted and grounded in that love. And we said that the best representation, the best expression of God's love for us is, is not our circumstances, but we must look to the cross. If you want to know how much God loves you, Look at the cross of Jesus. That's what the Bible tells us. So sometimes we make mistakes. We think, you know, we describe God's love for us based on, you know, how well things are going around us. And of course, things around us are going to change. There'll be good times and there'll be bad times. So there'll be easy times and there'll be hard times. But you cannot 
describe God's love based on your experience or circumstances. You always base your love, God's love for you on the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the description of God's love. And we've got to be deeply rooted and securely grounded in God's love. Nothing should change that. God loves you. Amen? So why don't you just tell your neighbor, just in case they forgot this morning, God, your heavenly Father, loves you. Amen? Just affirm that in case they forgot. <laughs> hey, there is a God in heaven who is your Father, and He loves you right now. He loves you with an immeasurable love. There's no measure to that love. And you need to be secure in that love. This morning, I want to build this a little further and talk about our Heavenly Father's true picture. You see, many of us uh, have had earthly fathers and thank God for earthly fathers. But our earthly fathers have not been perfect. And let me use the word parents to include mothers also. <laughs> Right? So our earthly parents have obviously, uh, no, 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 no parent is perfect. Thank God for parents who've been very good. And then we've had parents who've been not so good. So we all had our experience in life. But here's what happens. For, for many of us, our understanding of God somehow ties into our experience with our own parents. And sometimes we take our experience and apply it to God because we don't know better. So when we talk about father, immediately we tend to think, okay, my dad was like this. Or, you know, something. Or my parents were like that. And we tend to ascribe those characteristics to God. And very often, we don't end up with the right picture of God. So this morning, we want to look at some aspects of God as Father, as revealed to us in Scripture. So we're calling it the, the right picture, the true picture of our Heavenly Father. And as we go through this, we hope that you know, we, we, we develop a correct understanding of God, our Heavenly Father, a correct picture of God. And again, this is not complete. We're just picking up some aspects uh, of God as our Heavenly Father, the true picture. Let's go through some of these. God is an unchanging heavenly father. He's unchanging, constant. As compared to parents who sometimes are not, who are unpredictable. Morning, they're in a good mood. Afternoon, you're not sure. Evening, don't go anywhere near. I know this sometimes is, you know, we're just making light here. But we just contrast it. All right? We just contrast it. Now, for some of us, that could be so traumatic. Because I don't know if I can approach my parents now. It's going to be the good time to approach. Don't go near. Bad mood. <laughs> but God is an unchanging heavenly father. That means... Who he has said he is, his nature does not change like the weather. He's, if you want, constant. So whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, or no matter what we are going through in life, we can count on him. He's constant. This is who he said he is, whatever is revealed to us in the word of God. And so we know, God, my father. Is an unchanging God. Now, for each of these aspects, we can give several verses, but we will be looking only at one verse on each of these, um, just to, you know, to keep within time. James chapter 1 and verse 17, the Bible says, Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation. I mean, it's the same morning, noon, night. Today, yesterday, today, tomorrow. He's constant. He, he's not fickle. He's not changing. And so there is no variation. There is no shadow 
of turning. Like, you know, the shadow gets, you know, starts light and gets darker and darker. And so which part of the shadow is God in now? Now, God is constant. You can count on him. He's constant in who he is. So you, you know, this is who my heavenly father is. Now, the aspect of God, he's an unfailing heavenly father. Unfailing. He never fails. He never lets us down. Now, this is in contrast to parents who sometimes let us down. Or sometimes they are absentee parents. They are not there when you need them. And for some of us, this can be very painful. Because in, and in a moment of time or in a season of life, when you really, really, really wanted them, they were not there. It can be painful. But not so with God. He is an unfailing, heavenly Father. Unfailing. Never. Never. Never fails. Never absent. He's there. Again, just one verse. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said. He's given us his word. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, you know, as parents, sometimes we give that word to our children. You know, Josh, we are there for you, Josh, or whatever. You know, we're there. We, I mean, that's the ha our heart. That's our intent. But we are limited. So we fail. We're not there when they need us the most. But not with God. When he says, I will never leave you, never forsake you. It means that. There's no way other, other than that. He never leaves you. No. Now that has to be settled in your heart. My God never leaves me. Never. That's my father. My heavenly father. Amen. That's the way you and I should understand God. And inside you, you should be so convinced. God is too good to do me wrong. God is too wise to make a mistake. God is too strong to let me down. That's my heavenly father. It's got to be settled inside you. Amen? The third aspect, I just want to mention, is that he is a bountiful, generous father. He's a bountiful, generous father. Now, this is in contrast to parents. And again, I don't want to make it light because for some of us, we may have gone through some difficult times like this. But this is in contrast to parents who may be very stingy. Or maybe they're not able to give. Or they give, but it is always with condition. Don't come back and ask me next. <laughs> this is the last time. I mean, we've all gone to have that. I'm, not, I'm just trying to contrast, right? So we're not... Making fun of earthly parents. I'm just trying to contrast. But who? Are, what about God? He is a bountiful, generous father. He's, bountiful, he's generous, very generous. And he can be because he's God. As earthly parents, you're limited. And we, we are, we're trying to be careful with the resources we have. We only have so much. And we can only do so much. And so therefore, we have all of the constraints. Not so with God. I look at some scriptures. In Matthew 6, verses 31 and 32, Jesus said, do not worry what we will eat, what we will drink, what we will wear. For all these things the Gentiles seek or they're worried about. But your heavenly father knows that you have need of all these things. So your father knows your needs. And then he goes on to the next chapter in Matthew 7 verses 7 through 11. Uh, we are familiar with these verses. Jesus said, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives to those who seek, they find. Those who knock, the door will be open. And then he con contrasts. He's again contrasting. He says, which of you, as a father, if a son asks for bread, will you give him a stone? If he asks for an egg, will you give him a serpent? You know, or if he asks for fish, will you give him a, 
uh, a serpent, or we ask for, uh, yeah, what was that again? Yeah. All right. Okay, you can see it on the screen. Fine. So he says, verse 11, if you being evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? I mean, there's no measure. How much more, so much more, will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask? So our understanding of God is this. God is a generous God. He's a bountiful God. Think about James chapter 1, verse 5. James says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God. He says, you, you lack something. There's a need. Uh, in this particular case, you're talking about wisdom, but it refers, uh, applies to anything. If you lack something, ask God. And then he tells us about God. God who, what? Is very stingy? No. God who gives to all. That means he gives to everybody, you're included. And how does he give? Liberally. There's no rationing in heaven. He gives liberally, and thank God he included this, without reproach. He doesn't scold you. Hey, you came yesterday, only you asked me why you're back again today. No, he doesn't do that, without reproach, without scolding, without telling you that you're asking too much. No. What about God? He gives, he gives to all, he gives liberally, and he gives without reproach. That's God. A generous God. Now, our picture of God must be like that. My God, like it says in Psalm 84, verse 11, God is a sun and a shield. He will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk. That should be our understanding of God. That is, that's my God. That's my heavenly Father. Number four, a fourth aspect of God is God is a merciful Father. A merciful father. A, a father was slow to anger, abounding in mercy. Now, this is in contrast to earthly parents who may, at the drop of a hat, take out the. Now, we had one at home, okay? Actually, we worked through a few of them <laughs> with our kids. But earthly parents. Oh. They could be extremely disciplinary. So a small mistake. There may be no mercy. But God is a merciful God. He is slow to anger, abounding in mercy. Now this is not for us to take advantage or misuse, but to understand that even if I make a mistake, God is a merciful God. I can turn to Him. I can acknowledge my mistake. I can say, God, I'm sorry. I, I messed up. God, please forgive. There is mercy. Amen? He's not going to throw me out say, sorry. You should have learned it quickly. <laughs> Too late. Now. No. There is mercy with God. God is a God full of mercy. We know these scriptures, Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. Lamentations 3, 22, 23. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Look, all of us make mistakes. And, and, and thank God, because of His mercies, we are still standing. Otherwise, we would have all been consumed, gone. And his mercies are new, every fresh. He doesn't wake up and say, okay, you're down to the last 25 mm, cubic uh, cc of my mercy. That's it. This morning you've used it all up. No. Full tank. <laughs> every morning. His mercies are new, fresh. I'm ready to be merciful to you. That's our God. Five, he's a redeeming father. So as God who is redeem, redeeming, he always looks at our life. He looks at things in our life with a redemptive heart and with redemptive eyes. 
That means he is looking to bring things back, to restore, to rebuild, to raise up, to put them back into their original state. Now, because of our actions, because of our wrong choices, sometimes, you know, things go off track, uh, we get into trouble, uh, things are destroyed in our lives, we, things are wasted, things are ruined, so we make mistakes. But God is a redeeming father, that he's the God who can bring them back. Now, this is in contrast to parents who might just give an ultimatum. So if you don't do it, it's over. Finished. But not so with God. He's always redemptive. He's a redeeming father. And there is nothing that God cannot redeem. So when you look at your own life, when you look at other people that you relate to, look at them as your heavenly father would look at those circumstance situations with redemptive eyes, with a redemptive heart. How can this be brought back? How can this be restored? How can this be raised up? Because God's a redemptive God. He's a redeeming Father. One verse, Isaiah 63, verse 13. Doubtless you are our Father. Though Abraham was ignorant of us and Israel does not acknowledge us, you, O Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer. You're our Father, you are our Redeemer. You redeem, you restore us, you rebuild us, you bring us back to our place of glory and strength. Even though we may have made mistakes that have caused wastage and ruin. Number six, he is an accepting father. He accepts us, he delights in us. He looks at us with eyes of love. You're accepted in the presence of God. This is in contrast to parents who are unaccepted. Who look at you as unworthy, unfit. And, 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 and I don't want to say this lightly, but for some of us, that may have been our experience. That your parents never accepted you for who you are. So you didn't feel welcome in their presence. You couldn't approach them. You couldn't talk to them. You couldn't relate to them. I mean, they were your parents, but you were not accepted. You didn't feel accepted. Maybe they accepted you, but they, you didn't know it. That's, that's, that's some, for some of us, that has been our journey. But our Heavenly Father is an accepting Father. I mean, He is not looking at you. Or let me put it like this. He's look, he is looking at you with eyes of love. No condemnation. You are accepted in His presence. Amen? Now, when you know that, you're free. You can come before him. Father, I'm here to pray. Father, I'm here to talk to you. Father, I have a problem. You, you, you go like that. But you need to know that you are accepted by your heavenly Father. Just one verse again, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 through 6. In verse 4, he says, he has chosen us in him, in Jesus, even before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now let's say that together. I am holy without blame before the eyes of my father. You are holy and without blame before him in love. That's because of his love. But to know that is so important. That you are holy. You are without blame. In his eyes. Now he did that for us. Because of his love. And then we just jump to verse 6. It tells us. To the praise of the glory of his grace. By which he has made us accepted in the blood. You are accepted in the blood. The beloved is Christ. In Christ you are accepted. And that's so important to know. That your heavenly father is an accepting father. He's welcomed you. You're welcome in his presence. So let's say, to, say that together. I am accepted in the eyes of my father. You know? Now it tells us it's by grace and it's in Christ. So it's not something we worked into. He made us that way. But we have to know it. And now we relate to him based on father. I, I, I know you accept me. I can come into the presence of God without sense of guilt or shame or condemnation, judgment. I'm accepted. You are accepted in the eyes of the Father. Amen? 
Next one. Seven. Just a few more. He's a father of abundant grace. Abundant grace. Now what is grace? Grace gives us what we don't earn. Grace gives us what we don't deserve. That is grace. You know, like, sometimes people use this as an acronym. God's riches at Christ's expense. So Christ paid, but God's riches become ours. God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ paid for it. Jesus paid for it. Now his riches are given to us freely. Now this is in contrast to earthly parents where everything had to be earned. You get 50 marks, one biryani. <laughs> you get 60, something more. You get 70, I'll give you a phone. You get 80, I'll give you a bike. You get 90, a car, whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you've got to earn everything. Now, I'm not against incentives and encouraging people. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to make it light here. But the point is, sometimes... Uh, uh, our understanding of, 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 of a father is only that of, I had to earn everything. Only if I proved myself would I get something. There is no understanding of grace. And so for some of us, it's a culture shock. To accept grace. Because even when we become believers, we do the same thing. I prayed for one hour, so God will use me to minister to one person today. I prayed for two hours, so today God will use me to minister to two people. No understanding of grace. It's same calculative, law-based, works-based relationship with God. And that's not the Bible. The Bible talks about God of abundant grace. Now, I'm not saying don't pray. I'm not saying don't read the word. We must. But you don't do it to earn something. You do it because you experience something. Because of grace you do it. Why do I pray the whole day? Not because I want to earn something. But because I love my God. I love his word. I wouldn't do anything else but that. Because I've tasted. I want more. Not because I want to earn something. Because I know what it does for me. Are you with me? So we have to shift from a law-based relationship with God to understand that God is a God of bountiful grace and everything he gives us, it's because of grace. He gives it to you, not because you deserve it, not because you've been so good, not because you've been so smart, or not because you've been so uh, holy or pure. No, it's all by grace. Now you are holy because you've tasted his grace and you want to be like him. You can't help but be holy. I mean, if God has been so good to me, where else would I go? Because he's been so gracious. God, my whole life is yours. Amen? So God is a God of bountiful grace. And, and you find this throughout scripture. Uh, Ephesians 2, verse 1 example. Ephesians 2, verse 7. You know, in the ages to come, God is saying, look, I'm going to do this forever and ever and ever. What? He is going to show the exceeding riches of His grace. In His kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Through the ages to come. He said, I'm going to show this off. I'm going to display my grace. The grace I've had towards my people. Amen. And you know, sometimes this, this whole, if you don't understand grace, of course, grace is not to be abused. It's not a license to go and sin or live recklessly. recklessly. Uh, but uh, if you don't understand grace, then we begin to use the same thing towards each other. That person doesn't deserve to be up on stage. Why? Because we're not looking it through eyes of grace. We're looking it through our eyes of a merit law-based system. But God in His grace, He takes the weak things of the world, He confounds things that are mighty. He takes things that are nothing and He uses them for His glory. So you and I are like, God, I don't understand this. Good, you don't understand. That's the grace of God. 
Because for us, everything has to be earned. But God does things by His grace. And again, please understand, I'm not saying we should be, shouldn't be holy and all of that. That's important, but let it all come out of grace. Last two points, we close here. He's an empowering father. He's a father who empowers us. He, he looks at the best in us. He believes in us. And I'm saying it, and I try to understand what I'm saying. He, he's the one who empowers us. He says, go for it. You can do it. He empowers us. He's made us heirs. He's made us joint heirs. He's made us sit together at his own right hands. He says, use my name. Use my word. I put my Holy Spirit on you. I'm empowering you. And that's God. I'm empowering you. Go. Do it. Now, in contrast to parents who may not Trust us. Say, look, you're not ready. Sit down. God empowers us. I mean, we would hesitate to give the car key to our kids, and God is saying, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. I'm giving you the keys of the. How much more? Emp- I mean, you can't be more empowering than this. He said, look, I'm putting this kingdom in your hands. You bind and you lose on earth. I'll back it up. So empowering. God is an empowering God. And you need to understand that. Because when you understand it, then you're bold. You will step out. You will take risks. You will move in faith. You will know that God is backing you up. And, 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 and yes, there will be challenges and so on and so forth in this earth. But God is behind you. He's empowered you. Go forth. Do it. The vision God has given you, you step out on it. Go. Because God's backing you up. You're empowered by God. Amen? Now that's something we must understand. God empowers us. Luke 12, 32. Do not fear, little flock. It's your heavenly Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Whoa. Your heavenly Father wants to give you the kingdom. He's qualified us. Colossians 1.12 Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. So you are qualified to partake. He has an inheritance for his people. And he says, I've qualified you. You passed the test already. He said, but God, I didn't write any test. That's good. I passed you. You are qualified to enjoy the inheritance I have for my people. Is what God is saying. Give thanks. He's qualified you. That means, he says, look, you can take it. You can partake of this, this inheritance I have for my people, the spiritual inheritance, whatever I'm giving them, it's for you too. Empowered. Last. He's an infinite father. He's a God who's beyond measure. There's no measure to who he is, what he can do, what he can provide, what he can supply. Now, this is in contrast, of, obviously, to earthly parents who are limited. And what they can do, how they can help, how they can encourage. They're limited. And, and that's, 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 we're human. But not so with God. He's infinite. So he never grows old. He never grows tired. He never runs out of wisdom. You know, they'll say, oh, I'm sorry. I just, that problem is too complex. Go ask your grandfather. <laughs> no. He never runs out of wisdom. He's infinite. God, you're bigger than my biggest problem. You're bigger than my greatest need. You're bigger than my greatest dream. You're bigger than my greatest vision. You're bigger. You're bigger. Just bigger. Infinite. That's our Heavenly Father. So the Bible tells us God's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to His power that works in so in one way, God is both a father and a mother. He's complete. He's the El Shaddai. So there is a mother heart, if you want to put it like that, of the father God. Just mentioned this in Isaiah 49 verses 
4 to 14 to 16, he, he says, Zion said, that is his people have said, the Lord has forsaken me, my Lord has forgotten me. So that's sometimes as people we speak like that. But God is saying, look, I want to remind you, verse 15, can a woman, can a mother forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of a womb? Even if they forget, I will not forget you. I've inscribed you in the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. See, sometimes we speak like this. We say wrong things about God. And God is saying, hey, I need to remind you who I really am. So this morning, we must reject self-deception and Satan's lies. Self-deception means, look, I've got some wrong ideas about God because of, like we said, experiences and so on. We need to get rid of it. Okay, this is what the Word of God says. This is who my God is. I'm going to embrace Him for who He is. This is my Heavenly Father. And the enemy, Satan, is, is also the father of lies. So he wants to put wrong thoughts, wrong ideas in our minds about our Heavenly Father. Maybe reject it, get rid of it, dislodge it, get it out of your mind. So in case, if we are thinking that God is an unpredictable God, instead of an unchanging Heavenly Father... Then, hey, change that. God is an unchanging Heavenly Father. In case you're thinking that God is an unreliable God instead of an unfailing Heavenly Father. This morning, tell him, God, I know you are an unfailing Heavenly Father. If you think God's a stingy God, he has, you have to twist his arm to get him to give you something. No, no, no. Change that. He's a generous, bountiful Father. If you think God is a God who's waiting to judge you, throw down stones at you the moment you make a slight mistake, hey, change it. Your Heavenly Father is a merciful Father. If you're thinking God is a God who's keeping account of every wrong thing you've done, holding everything against you, no. God is a redeeming Father. He redeems what is lost. If you think God is a condemning God, no. He is an accepting father. If you think God is a God who's just so hard to satisfy, man, just give up. No. He's a God of bountiful, abundant grace. He gives to us in what we don't deserve. If you think God doesn't want us to work with him, partner with him, be his co-workers. No, 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 no. God has called us to be his co-workers. He's an empowering father. And lastly, God is an unlimited, infinite father. Amen. So, let's recognize and relate to God, our Heavenly Father, for who He truly is. This morning, look to God and say, Father, this is who you are. I accept you, embrace you. I welcome you to work in my life. Amen? I'm going to call the worship team up, please. We're going to spend some time just praying. So would you look to God this morning and change your, your perception, your view of God. Align it to the words. This is who my Heavenly Father is. And then invite Him to work in your life, in your circumstances, in your situations. And let's begin to embrace that even in how we relate to people. I'm not saying there's no discipline or order, but let's extend mercy. Let's extend grace. Let's Look at people with redemptive eyes. Let's flow in those things. That as we enjoy Him, we also express Him to other people around us. Take some time to pray, please. Father, we've Released your word. Thank you. 
Father, I pray that even this morning, because of the power of your words, that our hearts and our minds will be changed. That we will relate to you as who you really are. Father, I pray that in our lives, in our situations, in our circumstances, you will redeem, you will demonstrate your grace, demonstrate your mercy. Be this heavenly Father that your word reveals you to be, God in our lives.
Father God, we stand before you acknowledging your great love for us, God. Father, even now, because of your great love, because of your mercies, because of your goodness, Father, I pray you will send deliverances into our lives. The circumstances, the situations in our lives that need divine intervention, God. Things that may seem so hopeless, that aside from God, apart from God, there is no resolution. There is no answer. But today, because we are standing in the presence of an infinite Father who loves us, who is so abounding in mercy and grace and who is so redemptive and who is so powerful, God, right now, send your interventions. Send your divine deliverance into our life situations, into our life circumstances, Father. Let the hand of the Lord begin to move in our circumstances, in our situations, turn things around. To see the mercy of God, to see the grace of God displayed, to see the redemption of God take place in our lives. And in the name of Jesus, I oppose every work of the devil. I oppose every evil work of the enemy. Attempting to disrupt, hinder, destroy God's purpose for His people. In the name of Jesus, I declare that doors will open. I declare that opportunities will come. I declare that provision of God will come into the lives of God's people. I declare that bondages will be broken. I declare that sicknesses and diseases will be taken out of our midst because we have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. I declare confusions and torments and afflictions of the mind, anxieties, torments of the night be expelled in the name of Jesus because we have been made whole by Jesus Christ. So, Father, because of who you are, because of your great love, because of your great power, I declare your deliverance, I declare your redemption, I declare your provision being released in each of our lives, in each of our circumstances, in each of our situations, that we are blessed by God. That God releases grace and glory in our lives. That God releases supernatural provision in our lives. Interventions in our lives. We thank you, Father, for that. Thank you. We honor you. We bless you, God. This morning as you stand here, I want you to just say, Lord, I receive it. Whatever your circumstance, your area of need, you say, God, in that need, I receive this. I receive because you are my Father. You are intervening in my life situations. You are doing things on my behalf. You are answering prayer. You are meeting my needs. You are my bountiful, generous Father. No good thing will you withhold from those who walk uprightly. So I receive it, God. I receive it. Thank you, Father. Thank you. And I walk with my head lifted high, my heart full of confidence, because my Heavenly Father is for me. He loves me. He embraces me. He surrounds me with His love. He is unfailing. He never leaves me nor forsakes me. He never abandons me. He's with me. He's my Father. He's your Father. We give you thanks, O oh God, for your goodness in our lives, for your mercies, for your provisions. We thank you. We bless you. And we honor you.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each one of us always in Jesus' name. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.